thank you all very much for uh, being here today. I think it's been an extraordinarily positive uh, conversation so far and, and looking forward to this afternoon session. I meant it when I said let's have some fun this afternoon. Uh, so not that you haven't been having fun all day, but let's have a different kind of fun this afternoon. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dale Moore and David Smith who will help as we go through the afternoon with whatever process issues that we might have. Very briefly, what we're going to do between now and uh, probably about 3.45 or so, because we're starting a little bit early, um, do a quick summary of the science that we've heard this morning, Let's brainstorm some barriers uh, or challenges that may be facing uh, pre-slaughter appro approval of products uh, relative to protecting us against 0157 uh, at your individual tables, and I will pass out a sheet of paper for you to write down your ideas uh, on that. And, um, and then I'm going to introduce you to message mapping. How many of you have heard of message mapping? Some of you? None of you? What? A couple of you? Okay. Vince Cavello. Does that name ring a bell with anybody? Okay. We'll, um, then it's going to be a great tool that I think you're going to find very, very useful to you as you uh, go into the future. We'll target your message a little bit, give you some additional information, and then um, you're going to actually develop a message in groups of six. And so we're going to give you some information on, on who your audience is, and uh, we're going to use the challenges and barriers that you have brainstormed right up front in order to make it very relevant or as relevant as we can to you. So I think it'll be really interesting. Be forewarned, at the end of the day, one of your group will get up and deliver your message, or you can all do it together if you'd like to. But we will want to hear your message. So that's the plan. Very brief summary. Dr. Besser gave us uh, some very good information on uh, the fact that STEX are a small component of diarrheal diseases in, uh, in the United States and that 0157 is the one that is most significantly associated with disease, uh, virulent disease in humans. However, he did report on this 0104 in Europe that had very similar virulence to 0157. So obviously there is uh, uh, more to that story. He talked a little bit about the new prevention policy uh, that's uh, going to start trace back of contaminated products a bit earlier as possibly improving the effectiveness of recalls. But uh, left unanswered, I think, at this point is whether or not that will significantly impact the safety of food and reminded us that there are no known control measures addressing non-0157 STEC prevalence. <clears throat> he talked, I thought, uh, very interestingly about the uh, particular kind of toxin and maybe rather than uh, typing the bacteria, we ought to be typing the toxins that are in these bacteria. Maybe that's the uh, common denominator that we need to be looking at and then had uh, similar questions about genotyping and particularly feedlot versus dairy cattle with respect to sources of, of this particular disease. We've talked about seasonal variation. Tom presented information that suggests that that may have more to do with the exposure of the cattle at that particular time rather than changes in the cattle physiology or their rumen microflora. Quite a few speakers talked about this, this super shedder state and how it seems to be transient within individuals. One of the problems as a veterinarian I have, I bring to the table, is that we've been talking about super shedders with bovine virus diarrhea for, for decades. But those are individual animals that if we can identify and pull out of the herd, then we know that we've eliminated that source of infection. This is not that, yet it's the same terminology. So it's, it's very uh, confusing for me and I have to recognize that we're talking about an entirely different scenario than the paradigm that I grew up with. And then finally that there are some cattle that uh, seem to be resistant to the infection and there were lots of opportunities we talked about for uh, mitigating uh, science to help determine what kind of mitigations may work better. Dr. Render talked about a number of those, reminded us that this bacteria is ubiquitous in nature. It's found in lots of other animals. He listed uh, Tanner or 12 additional animals um, and the fecal oral route of transmission means that uh, many of those can be uh, mechanical and not biological transmitters of the disease. They can carry it from point A to point B without being sick. He did identify uh, summer seasons as the highest shedding rate and he talked a little bit about diets but again uh, reminded us that the 
mechanism of that is not well understood and that the ecology of 0157, thinking of it, if we go back to Dr. Raymond's comments this morning, thinking of it as an environmental toxicant rather than an infectious disease that, that only survives in a given host, uh, the ecology of 0157 is uh, an area for some rich work in the future. Dr. Sargent talked to us a little bit about how vaccinated cattle were less likely to shed E. coli 0157, that the probiotic treatment in cattle in non-commercial herds were less likely to shed E. coli 0157, raising that question about the latest study in commercial herds and some of the questions that it raised. I think a very important point that I want to reemphasize, she, she made the point several times, but I want to emphasize it one more time, it's likely that there are many unmeasured food safety benefits from lowering the shedding concentration in cattle. And again, going back to my training, uh, we know that if, with rabies in a population, if we can get about 50% of the population vaccinated, we'll stop an epidemic of rabies through that population. That those same kinds of principles may apply here. And so lowering that concentration may actually be a very important target for whatever our mitigation is, not trying to eliminate or, or uh, zero out the shedding, but just lowering the concentration of those organisms. And <clears throat> then she also asked this question, what other impacts may that intervention have for pathogens other than the s -tex? Great question. Dr. Chan talked about um, the approved pre-slaughter um, interventions for 0157, including bacteriophages and, and vaccines, and the GAO's recommended uh, report suggesting USDA provide some more specific guidance on vaccine approval and explore what other countries are doing for this particular uh, group of organisms. Dr. Hayes went through this list of uh, areas that needed to be uh, demonstrated uh, to gain approval of FDA and <clears throat> then reminded us that while food additives are regulated, drugs are actually approved and there's a difference between those two. We talked about those differences. I noted that GMOs require approval, which I, I had not thought about. Thank you for that information. And uh, that, of course, non-0157s join 0157s as being designated as adulterants. FDA considers any product with an intended effect, intended effect on an STEC as a drug, so it has to go through the approval process. And that he talked <coughs> a little bit about the coalition that they put together to try to consider future approaches for approval. Dr. Ripke listed those specific products that come under USDA Center for Veterinary Biologics Authority. And um, that now, of course, includes those that are reducing or eliminating carrier states as of 2005, I believe it was. He noted that these standards evolve with time, and so with the new product, then the standards are not very explicit, that they, those standards evolve with experiences of going through the approval process with products that are, that are in that uh, line. And uh, so, uh, therefore, very specific standards at the front end of an approval of a new drug like this, or a new vaccine like this, uh, would not be possible. And then I'm, I'm, I heard the words same requirements as regular vaccines and similar requirements as regular vaccines. So uh, maybe uh, Dr. Ripke can help us with that as we get into the discussion phase a little bit longer, but just a little bit later, just making sure that we understand whether or not we're, we're using the same framework for a vaccine against a disease that, if, that it impacts an individual animal as the framework for these particular products. He did summarize, I thought, uh, beautifully uh, that they're looking for a significant, meaningful, and relevant reduction in the carrier state and a consistently positive benefit. And I think we will agree that, that the framework that Center for Veterinary Biologics has had, it's a, it's a, a stretch for STEX to fall exactly in that framework because they, they are different. And there will be other issues that will follow these. So we're pioneering a new, uh, a new area of vaccination uh, at this point in time. So I want to invite anybody to add any, any of the speakers to add any uh, corrections to anything that I may have misstated. And Dr. Ripke, I may ask you to just start with that. Is it 
are we required to do the same as other vaccines or is it similar? Maybe, let me come over with the microphone here so that uh, we can capture this. Hold it here. Okay. The point I was trying to make was that the vast majority of requirements are exactly the same as they are for any other vaccine, but there are obviously some, some differences with how you determine efficacy of a product like this given the, the issues that, that Aztec E. coli has caused. So that, you know, for, if you're talking safety, if you're talking purity, if you're talking the basic background testing that you would do on any product, it's exactly the same. When you start talking about efficacy, it's similar, but different. Thank you very much. Other speakers? Comments that I may have misstated? Anybody need other clarification? Okay, so this is your chore in, in your groups. And again, try to work in about groups of six. If you've got, you know, seven, probably, uh, you know, a, a group of four or three may go a little bit easier for you. But what I'd like for you to do, I'm just going to give you each group a, a, a page that you can record challenges and barriers that you might identify. Are you guys going to move up into these groups or are you going to? I guess you've got enough there to, to work. Okay, great. So we're looking for what challenges or barriers exist in preventing the approval of pre-slaughter interventions to lower shedding of STEX and cattle. The goal is for you guys to simply brainstorm a bit. You're going to slight, OK. So just brainstorm. Identify a bunch of them. You don't need to rank them necessarily. But uh, if you want to try to decide what's the most important to you, that's fine too. Uh, so brainstorm what those things are. I'm going to give you about 10 minutes, so that means you don't have a lot of time to uh, introduce yourself to each other. You're going to have to just get right to work. Are there any questions on your assignment? Okay, the clock starts. So we're going to talk about messages and mes message mapping right now, and I want to give credit to these two uh, national centers who helped fund a project, uh, I don't know, five or six years ago, where we developed some risk communication tools for veterinarians, particularly around food defense and foreign animal disease. Um, and amongst that, uh, the message mapping uh, became a part of that particular educational materials. Message maps anticipate the questions and concerns of the people that you're trying to send your messages to. So as a university professor, what do we do? We get up, we know what it is we want to say, we give the best lecture of our life, however it has no relevance to our students other than that we have a degree that we're hanging over them and they have to get through an examination on the other side. Okay. Message mapping recognizes that adults don't learn that way. You don't have a hammer over those people. What you have to do is hit them with information that's relevant to them, timely for them, and treats them, again, with the principles needed for an effective adult education, which is different than teaching a 25-year-old student, again, who's in a degree pro uh, program. They may be an adult chronologically, but they're not a, an adult in that setting. It also provides you with this great framework for organizing your information, and it, it um, helps you understand what is your message, because frequently we don't know after we've delivered our message, what our message really was. We just get uh, started uh, talking. So for a national news item about a controversial topic, how long is television or radio giving that particular reporter today? I gave you a hint. If we go back, if we go back 20 years, it was about 50 seconds, 50, 60 seconds. So what is it today? Three minutes. Three Three minutes. That's how, that's how much time you've got really to capture them, is that seven to nine second window. And incidentally, as a, a former clinical practitioner, when I walked onto a farm or if I walked into an exam room in a, in a clinic somewhere or another, it's about the same. That's, that's how quickly they decide whether I'm competent, whether I'm highly educated, whether or not I care for their critter enough that they're going to put their critter's care 
in my hands, etc. Seven to nine seconds. You've got about 30 words per message before the mind starts wandering. Why? Well, we, we're talking to a population that has immediate gratification. They have all of these distractions in front of them. They have been trained not to stick with something for a long period of time. Seven to nine seconds, 30 words. You can get about three messages into them before they become confused. I'll show you some of the reasons for that in a minute. And again, I talked about this nine second window for them to determine whether they trust you or not. Where did risk communication start? Anybody have any idea? What, what was the, the uh, birthing episode? You talk about a crisis, Dr. Raymond. There was a crisis in this country that birthed the concept of risk communication. Some of us in this room are old enough to remember it. <laughs> Only a few. It's called Three Mile Island. And Three Mile Island, of course, was a meltdown of a nuclear power plant in Pennsylvania. And <clears throat> they got an engineer up. Any engineers in the room? Okay, they got an engineer up with the little plastic lapel thing with all the pins and, and the slide roll on their, their belt, etc. So you know the concept. And they, this person came up in front of the audience and they said, there's nothing to worry about. <laughs> and what happened? People jammed the freeways trying to get, it, get it out of Pennsylvania. And so suddenly, that's when it became an academic exercise. People started wondering, how do you communicate risk in a way that's effective for the people that you're talking to? That's that nine second trust area. Okay, there's, a, a, there's another body of research out there that says, <clears throat> if you give people no choices, particularly you know, you deliver no messages, they receive no information. If you give them only one message, the food is safe, as an example. Adults like to think that they have some control over their own lives and that they get to make choices for them and that they are unique and that their choice may be different than your choice. I noticed we had, for instance, two entrees today for lunch. Some people had chicken and some people had beef. So, uh, we like choices, and if you give people only one option, this is the message, take it or leave it, then they feel like they had no messages. They actually reject the information that you were giving them. And if you give them more than five, it would take an unusual person to be able to manage that many choices. And so what they do is they, they sort of freeze up, short circuit, and they hear no messages. They can't remember any of the choices if you give them too many choices. So again, the literature is pretty clear. Two to four messages is about what a person can handle. Each message should be probably about 30 words long. And that would take about 10 seconds to deliver if you did it just in, in one um, gulp with a few breaths. <coughs> So what we're going to do is uh, define the, uh, we're not doing it just yet, but I'm just getting you prepared. We're going to define the audience we want you to speak to. So we've got four groups. I got three audiences, uh, three different audience groups. Maybe we can decide whether or not we want to add a fourth or uh, two groups want to handle the same audience when we get to that point. The main category, and this is how you would organize message mapping, the main category here would be pre-slaughter prevention of STEX. You would do the same sort of thing if you were organizing your information in message mapping format for whatever is the issue. If this was mad cow disease, you would have a little group of messages, preformed pre messages for mad cow disease. If it were Campylobacter, you would do the same thing. You can predict about 80% of the questions that you're likely to get from, from different audiences. And so all we're saying is, why don't you predict some of those have those messages pre-thought out so you don't have to do it on the fly and spend some time making sure that you craft your messages carefully to actually communicate exactly what you want. So the main heading here is pre-slaughter prevention of STEX. You've, in your challenges and barriers that you've identified in each one of your groups, you'll choose one of those. That will be the particular question or concern that you're gonna try to create a message for. Okay. The concept is to create your message short, succinct. As scientists, we want to tell people everything we know. So they're like run-on sentences, you know, 40-word 40, 40 messages 
rather than a five-word message and some supporting information associated with it. And frequently what we'll do is say, well, if, I can, if I'll tell you you can only put one thing in your message, you will put three or four things in that message. You just won't use any punctuation. Okay. Okay. So what we need you to do is to really honker down here and make sure that you only are saying one thing in your message. Okay. So message one, what is your claim? What is it that you want that, that person to understand at the end of your message? What's your claim? Then you're going to provide some supporting data and statistics. What information, independent information, supports the claim that you're proposing to that person? What's the evidence that they can then look at and say, OK. And then the third thing, if, if you have had a personal experience with that, if you can, an anecdote of some sort, uh, Dr. Raymond used a number of those examples today in the messages he was delivering with respect to some of the experiences he had while he was in his position here. But that personal experience actually brings some emotion to you when you're delivering a message and it makes it more effective. And it's more believable because you've been through it. The, the audience now can say, okay, they've lived through it. I understand how they've lived through it. Therefore, your credibility goes up. So if you've had that experience, use it. If you haven't had the experience, don't make it up because it shows. Okay, so come up with some other data or statistics to support it. So the, what's your claim? What do you want them to know at the end of your message? What data or statistics supports the claim that you've just made? Why should they believe you? And then the third thing I like to think about is why do you believe it? So number two is why should they believe your claim? Number three is why do you believe your claim? That's a very important piece that makes it sellable again. And then you would create a second message. So in this setting, I might have a little file card uh, that on my desk <coughs> that would have 10 messages about STEX that I have identified. Three of them may be for one audience, three of them may be for another audience. If I was talking about it to a group of uh, mothers that were concerned about school lunches, my messages would be different than talking to this audience, as an example. So you have to customize your message to the audience. And I would have my key message, number one, data, experience, anecdote. Number two, something different, an entirely different area. Number three, et cetera, maybe up to 10, maybe up to 15. You don't want to do this forever, because you don't know when you're going to have to use it. But it's really useful to do about 10 on any particular case and think about different audiences. So here's an example. This is an actual example. About 2004, uh, Mike Machado, a senator in California, introduced a bill in the California State Senate that would require testing of all slaughter cattle for mad cow disease. And he did this because he lived in an area where a lot of beef cattle were raised, and the Japanese market had been closed to California producers. So a lot of his constituents were angry and knocking on his door. So I got to go testify at this hearing along with a whole bunch of other people. But here are just a couple messages that I gave that just to give you an, as an example of how this message mapping might work. The first one is simply BSE is an extremely rare event in US production systems. Okay. One point, rare. US is different than, than Europe. Uh, so in our setting, with our feeds, our production system, et cetera, not a big deal. USDA sampled more than 700,000 animals, high-risk animals, and only found three positives. Tests are reported to being able to find one positive in a million. One per million would be the same as being able to identify one car in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic between single-lane bumper-to-bumper tra traffic between San Francisco and Cleveland, Ohio. Okay. Pretty simple, but they walked away understanding that it is a very rare event. Then the second piece, you can see what that is. Each of them are about 30 words long. It takes longer to write a 30-word message than a 3,000-word message. <laughs> okay. But it's more effective. And, and when you're talking to the California, I won't speak for all politicians, but when you're talking to the California state legislature, believe me, you've got to keep it short. Now, I circled the word only there. Anybody trip over that word when you read that? No? I didn't actually use that word. I, I put it in the, to uh, provoke you in some way. Because what, what does that word 
say, I've changed that sentence. If I said USDA sampled more than 700,000 high-risk cattle and found three positives versus found only three positives, what have I done by adding a only? Yeah. It's my value, isn't it? I've, I've now used my judgment to say, you should dismiss this. This is, this is meaningless to you. And, and again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use an example. <coughs> um, USDA Secretary Ann Veneman, who, has, who is a personal friend and a great lady, when, when uh, Dale's Washington State dairy people had the first mad cow disease in the United States, I always liked it, jerk her in that way. Um, she got up, I think, on Friday night before Christmas and said, I'm feeding my family roast beef for Christmas. That was her risk communication. What does that mean to you? Was that effective? Do you think that, that helped the consumer audience? Did it stabilize the beef prices in the United States, et cetera? Yeah. I think it's totally ineffective, personally. And it's ineffective, again, because it's her personal value. She gets to feed her family beef. First of all, I don't know if she even likes her family. Actually, I do. <laughs> I actually do, and she, she loves her family very much. But that said, how would you know that? Okay. Secondly, I don't know what kind of risk she's willing to take. You know, I, when I drive my car, I, I put my seatbelt on. I ride with some people that still don't put seatbelts on unless they see a policeman around. So we have different risk aversion levels, and, and it's my right to be more risk averse than somebody else. So the concept here is to not try to get people to agree with your opinion. It's to give people the information they need to make their own decision based on their risk potential, risk adversity. Okay, so I would leave the word only out. And you could come over here. Here's another one. We'll do more to protect the food supply. Now, I, I, I pondered whether or not I should leave that in. I did. But because I feel that it was true and that it was, um, it was not a really a value-laden, but it was a defensible position to take. But others might say no. Okay, this is the famous two-by-two two table. All ep epidemiologists were born with a two-by-two two table, I think, uh, in their pocket somewhere. Um, <laughs> But it's very useful in thinking about how you target your message to the particular audience you talk, you're talking to and the situation that it involves. And so we'll start down here in the bottom left where <coughs> the danger level is pretty low based on scientific evidence, and the public isn't very interested in it. There is no fear or outrage associated with the public in that particular area. Messages at that point need regular, consistent public relation messages again, to inform the public. So something like BSE infection is a very small threat to U.S. beef might be one of those situations. And if you looked at, at what happened when the second BSE case was found, very little drop off in, in U.S. production because we had done a good job of making sure U.S. Uh, consumers were aware that we were different than Europe. US, U.S. beef is safe. That's another comment that would be very hard for people to make because safe is a relative term. So if I move over here now to the bottom right-hand corner of the two-by-two two table, it's called precautionary advocacy. This is when people scientifically perceive a high hazard and yet people are not very concerned about it. So what do you think the message is with this picture? Anybody have a feel for that? It's rolling rock beer, incidentally. It's a very coordinated baby, so he's affluent. But somebody's trying to provoke a reaction. Who, what do you, who do you think the audience is for the picture? Pregnant women, exactly. And that if you drink a beer, your baby's drinking a beer with you. Okay. So using something like this to provoke or arouse concern to get that apathetic and inattentive audience to pay attention is a useful thing to do. So if you're in that situation, you're going to have to be a little more outrageous to be sure they heard your message, because otherwise they don't really care. So here's one, upper left-hand corner, outrage management. You have a, usually a small number of very outraged people, a larger general population that isn't very concerned, but that small number is certainly committed. And in this situation, 
It's listening to them that's probably the most important thing. There are very few messages you can send to those people that will calm their fire. What they need to do is to be heard in some sort of setting. Okay. So what's their message over here? This is another uh, picture intended to provoke somebody. This is coming from a particular group of people. Which group of people? The anti-vaccine people. Don't vaccinate my child. Exactly. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's a skull and crossbones right here, and it says poison right below it. Most of us, I think, would agree that vaccination uh, has allowed us to live very healthy in a, a world full of microbes. And then finally, the last, the last corner up here, crisis communication. This is a situation where people are just afraid and miserable, and they don't need scientific messages. They need empathy. Uh, Rudolph Giuliani was wonderful after 9-11 in this regard, you, you know, from his hat to his coat to going to every funeral he possibly could uh, in that setting. He did all the right things, propelled him into the presidential race for a very sh short period of time. Um, so when we craft your messages, I'm not going to have you work in this setting because they don't need much in the way of messages. But you, can, you have your choice of choosing any of the other three. Outrage, high outrage, low hazard, low hazard, low outrage, and high hazard, low outrage, any one of those other three areas. Okay, so I want you to develop one message to, to feed back to us. So I just concentrate on one message only. Using this message mapping format, again, be prepared to have somebody come up and report that message at the end of the session. We're going to have you come to the podium because uh, we want to be sure that we capture it for posterity. Um, okay, so I've, I've uh, as I say, I was prepared for a few more tables, but here are the four questions you generally try to answer when you're developing your message. Question number one is, why should the audience care about the topic? Don't use that one in your exercise today. Don't use the why. Use the second, third, or fourth, and again, I'll, I'll uh, allocate that to you guys in a minute. Number two is, what, are, what is the one most important thing you want your audience to know? I'm going to define your audience. Based on the challenges and barriers you chose, what's the one thing you want your audience to know out of, out of that list? The, the next group will ask, what's the one thing your audience wants to know? Usually those are different. They shouldn't necessarily be different, but usually they want to know something different than you want them to know. And then the final one, the third group, is what's the one thing your audience will get wrong if you don't emphasize it in a message? So each one of those are exclusive of the others. I'm going to have you address those. And again, I'll, I'll go around and assign these uh, table by table here in just a second. If you need, we, we have a number of our content experts uh, scattered around the room, uh, on the panels, et cetera. You can ask them for more detailed content-wise, you know, the, the data or statistics. I wouldn't spend a lot of time collecting a lot of data or stats. I would just try to pick out one salient point. What I'm really looking for is what's your claim? What's that short message? Give me one piece of data that supports it, and then give me a, an anecdote, an experience, or another piece of data or stat to support it. Uh, Dave uh, and Dale and I will run around in case you have any process questions as we go. And so I'm going to suggest that one of you handle the regulatory or policy people as your target audience. Does anybody want that particular group particularly? Okay, well then I'm going to give it to this group right here. Okay, so you're red. Okay, the second group, food systems from wholesaler through the consumer. So that would include restaurants, grocery stores, anybody that handles food uh, from uh, slaughter on. Anybody want that group particularly? Okay. Give that to this group back here. And the, the uh, third group, oh, sorry, this is the one you want, blue. Colors are too complicated. Okay, the third group. Producers and producer organizations. Okay. I thought that might be the case. Okay, and the fourth group, what do you want? Do you want a different, one, different audience than that, or do you want one of those? Producers? 
Producers. Why don't you do producers? OK. So those are your assigned audiences. <coughs> you are going to choose one of the questions. What do you want it? You want them to know? I'll go back and show that uh, color for you to make sure you've got it. What do they want to know? What will they get wrong unless you emphasize it? So those are going to go around the room as well. Uh, you're going to select from your challenges and barriers uh, your particular issue, and then you're going to craft a key message, some supporting data or stats, an experience anecdote or more data. Total about 30 words. Now, if it's 40, it's 40. So don't, don't worry too much about it. And try to demonstrate your point with some colorful and memorable phrasing, if you can, because that helps people remember it. If you can't, don't worry about it. Just make sure you get your point out there. But don't be afraid to, to think about something that might help people remember. 